for the first time, I'm on the ACP platform. I have my mentor and my close friend right in front of me. I have another close friend of mine who is introducing me, and there cannot be any better combination. The topic that is given to me is the crippling illness, ILD. Is it preventable? And my talk is not going to be as impressive as my previous speaker's talk, where she spoke about preventing osteoporosis. No, I cannot prevent interstitial lung disease. Interstitial lung disease people who suffer, we can try to improve their quality of life to some extent. program has got just another flavor as another close friend and mentor is here, Dr. Andit Guleri. My sincere thanks to my teacher, Professor, Director Dr. Tesi Mohanty, Jayanta, Srini, of course, Dr. Murugunathan, Mangesh, all of you, educational partners to today's program, and of course, Dr. Anuj Maheshwari team, and all my patients who gave me chance to learn respiratory medicine and probably be here in front of you. This technology is ILD, a death sentence once upon a time. When I was a student 22 years ago, a death sentence, patients do not improve. They are put on steroids and what was discussed in the previous talk, they have all possible complications because of steroid. They either die of their disease, illness, crippling respiratory failure or die of drug-induced complication. And it makes me talk to you about this do not take life too seriously. You will never get out of it alive. And, but do to take your ILD seriously. You will not get out of your for sure. But not only you, your entire family, all close relatives, dependent people suffer because of it. And I was talking to Dr. Murugnathan, okay, sir, how do I explain the importance of this? crippling disease. You know, people are paying more attention to diabetes. They are more worried about hypertension. They are more worried about heart diseases. But somehow, I... Ja, Simran, ja. Jee apni zindagi. And while coming from the airport, you know, the, there was a radio ad and they were talking about, she was so breathless, the interstitial lung disease, you know, that is what patients suffer. You send it to me, sir. And so you can't really enjoy your life to your full extent. The simple pleasures of life, like running away with somebody, you have to do it on the next day. There was a one ad on the radio while I was coming from airport to the hotel. And it, it was about some news channel, you know, and they were talking about conquering the world. They said, India ko jeetna hai, to pehle India ko samaj lo, you know. If you want to conquer the country or world, whatever, you need to understand the world. And I was just relating it in my mind. If you really want to prevent interstitial lung disease, first, we have to understand interstitial lung disease. And that's what I'm going to do for next 15 or 20 minutes. I'm going to be talking about interstitial lung disease. So it refers to a diffuse parenchymal lung disease and it is a group of about 150 different type of disease. A distinct clinical presentation as well as a radiological and pathological finding may help you characterize each interstitial lung disease. There are various key differences between clinical presentation and more frequent COPD diagnosis. So whenever a patient comes to you, you may end up, oh, so sorry, you may end up uh, you know, misdiagnosing them as interstitial lung disease. And a term interstitial is misnomer since it not only affects the interstitium, it also involves the cellular and the interstitial components of alveolar wall, including the alveolar spaces. And hence it is more appropriate. Nowadays, we're not labeling it as interstitial lung disease. We are calling it as diffuse parenchymal lung disease or something called as DPLD. So I was just preparing a small 
while preparing for this small talk, I was looking at my data and what kind of patients are referred to me as COPD. And when I looked at it, out of 100 patients who were referred to me as COPD, as a chest physician from my colleagues, only 45 were actual COPD and 23 had interstitial lung disease. Seven had uncontrolled asthma. There were few patients who had GRD, few patients who have occupational lung disease, even one had bronchiectasis. When I looked at what kind of interstitial lung disease I am seeing, I'm in, in, in Bombay, out of last 48 ILDs that I had, the majority of chunk was IPF. IPF is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I had sarcoid, vasculitis, cryptogenic organizing pneumonias, and a, a significant proportion of patients would remain unclassified in spite of doing whatever limited workup that we can do in our practice. And now in COVID times, you're seeing a lot of organizing pneumonias also presenting as interstitial lung disease. This is how we look at interstitial lung disease spectrum now. We're looking at interstitial lung disease of known causes. Say you have a particular collagen vascular disease, something that you physicians manage far better than what we do. You have drug-induced lung disease. You have granulomatous ILDs. Look at the third column, like sarcoidosis, like tuberculosis. You have certain uncommon unique entities like lymphangioliomyomatosis. You have eosinophilic pneumonias, etc. And comes a bigger chunk of what is there in blue, idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. And out of the idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, the major chunk is with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And then you have various other diseases in that. You have even the organ uh, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia or something what we saw now with COVID, the kind of organizing pneumonia. And when you take evaluation when you take clues from their presentation you you get you get to narrow down your differentials so whenever there is rapidly worsening rapid onset this is you're talking about probably post infection something we saw in this viral infections or you could see it with variety of viral infections as well it could be acute hypersensitivity pneumonia you could see with smoking rbild dip you could see occupational pneumoconiosis or you may have even drug induced interstitial lung disease in that appropriate setting. When you have patient presenting to you with hemoptysis and when you, there is a suspicion of interstitial lung disease, you're talking about probably a, a alveolar hemorrhage syndrome. You're talking about lymphangioliomyomatosis. You may be talking about superimposed infections. If patient has got pleurisy, it may be connective tissue disorder related interstitial lung disease. If they have ocular symptoms, again, a vasculitis, again, rashes would mean a connective tissue disorder. Exposure to organic antigen would clinch diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. If there is dryness of eyes, dryness of mouth, you know you're talking about probably Jogren syndrome, myalgia, muscle weakness would point to various connective tissue disorders. There are various uh, presentation also would give you idea about etiology. Like anybody presenting in fifth or sixth decade, you know, generally it is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Male patients, chances of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis are higher compared to women. And when it is relatively younger age, you're talking about connective tissue disorders or sarcoidosis, et cetera. This is a classical radiological finding of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Radiology have really changed the way we look at interstitial lung disease. And to my mind, IPF diagnosis is must because idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a different treatment Rest, all ILDs will require steroid. But in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, steroid is not at all useful. In fact, it is more detrimental. It does more harm to your patient. And CT scan, HRCTs done properly, could clinch diagnosis in most of these cases. So you have uh, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis pattern where there is no mediastinal involvement, when there is no pleural involvement. It's purely a parenchymal involvement. It is mainly, there is a, a, a pisis and the basal involvement. You have stakes of bronchiectasis. There are like, you know, piles of bronchiectasis, one after the other bronchiectasis, layers of bronchiectasis you see in periphery. And there is not much of mosaic pattern. There is not much of ground glasses. There is not much of air trapping is the classical feature of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. You see this picture. And this is the picture of NSIP. You see more of consolidation. You see more of air bronchograms. And you see this picture. This was the case of actually a Jogren syndrome. This is what I was talking about, a classical, you see multiple layers of bronchiectasis at the periphery and no air trapping, no ground glassing. This is a classical case of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. 
This is what we see in COVID. You see a peripheral line. Instead of peripheral sparing, you see a, a dark line at the periphery. This would go against idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is a feature of organizing pneumonia or hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And the next slide is showing IPF to give you a comparison idea. This is the ground glassing. Whenever you have ground glassing, you take deep inspiratory and expiratory cut. Many a times even mosaic pattern or air tripping would present with ground glassing. Once you have ruled out that, this would mean hypersensitivity pneumonitis, PCP, NSIP, even fluid there, even bleeding there in the lungs would present like this. But this is not a feature of IPF. The whole idea is to differentiate IPF from non-IPF radiology. Plural involvement will give you different set of differentials, associated adenopathies, and the curly B lines will help you narrow down your differentials of interstitial lung disease. Coming down to IPF, it is defined as specific form of chronic fibrosing interstitial pneumonia, which are limited to lung. COPD is a systemic disease. You have variety of system getting involved in COPD, but in IPF, it is only lung which are involved with histopathology of UIP pattern on surgical biopsies. It is very important to understand when I say UIP, P, pneumonia does not mean infection. It is only inflammation. And when I say usual, it means that most commonly the histolo histopathological features that you see on sites. Starts little late, fifth decades onwards, rarely seen uh, in, in fourth decade. General survival is poor, untreated, life expectancy only two to three years. And it is associated with a classical sign of UIP on radiology. Initially, we used to believe we don't see many cases of uh, IPF in India, but we have enough uh, uh, studies which has come from country all over and believe that, yes, we also have decent cases of IPF. And in fact, a lot of us believe that after viral infections, like what happened in COVID, a small subset of patients may behave like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and may have uh, disproportionate fibrosis going on in them. Risk factors, male, old age, smoking, certain infections, GRD, associated genetic link between diabetes and other metabolic disorders, environmental factors also play important role. Very gradual to begin with, patient have cough, uh, breathlessness comes up a little later, Digital clubbing is seen in significant proportion of those patients and uh, the disease eventually progresses the entire lung, have respiratory failure, patient eventually may develop pulmonary hypertension. If patient is a smoker, you may have a combined feature. So they may have emphysema because of smoking and you have something called a CPFE, combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema kind of presentation. So you will make diagnosis of IPF if patient is, uh, has cough and unexplained breathlessness where you have ruled out other causes of diffuse parenchymal lung disease, like you know patient is not on any treatment, there are no genetic disease, patient does not have connective tissue disorders, and you will do their lab investigation, you will do their spirometry, you will do that CT scan, and would give you diagnosis. In a doubtful situation, you may have to subject them to biopsies, that is open lung biopsy. We, earlier, we used to believe that there is some insult, chronic inflammation, and fibrosis. Now we believe it is the repeated inflammation, repeated injuries, which leads to aberrant wound healing, and that results into pulmonary fibrosis. Histopathology is not done by and large nowadays. Currently, the idea is to do a multi-speciality joint consultation for doubtful cases. If everybody does not agree on the same page and there are doubt for this special if a patient is younger patient, you may subject them to biopsies. Otherwise, in situation, CT scans, clinical evaluation, ruling out other disease would clinch diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. If you do that lung biopsy, there are various patterns which talks about UIP pattern, probable pat pattern, possible UIP pattern, or the features which are not suggestive of UIP. When you don't do surgical biopsy, if you have excluded other causes, if classical radiology features are there, and if patient has got uh, bibasilar creps, you do their spirometry, which is restrictive, you can safely make the diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. HRCT, there are different patterns. That is uh, UIP pattern. The classical pattern is subpleural disease distribution, basal predominance, reticular abnormality, honeycombing with or without traction bronchiectasis. So whenever you have this kind of distribution without any pulmonary, without any uh, pleural involvement, without any lymph node involvement, you can be certain that this is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is the same thing. You can see this 
arrows which are shown you have a peripheral distribution with stakes of bronchiectetic reticular shadows so whenever you have uh, suspected interstitial lung disease of ipf variety if you there are no other connective tissue causes no drugs no exposure responsible you are you can get ct scan done ct will give you uip pattern and your diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is made if there are other treatable causes other identifiable cause say there is a lymph node there there is a distribution which is a, a peri vascular you know they are talking about sarcoidosis if there are lymph nodes etc fungal infection etc etc you it is non ipf and you would treat them accordingly if there is any doubtful area you may subject them to investigations like open lung biopsy management luckily 2014 2015 has been game changer and whatever treatment we tried earlier had failed and it was concluded that there are only two drugs which has shown some improvement in patients of pulmonary fibrosis idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and that is nentendanib and perfenadone and we have a negative recommendation for all other drugs including sildenafil mesitentan bosetan anticoagulation there was a very uh, popular treatment of prednisolone azathioprine and acet n acetylcysteine all these studies were proved useless and there was some evidence for nentendanib and perfenadone i i would just show you the comparison between these two drugs this is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor whereas perfenadone is inhibitor of uh, tgf beta uh, both have got uh, both have shown good efficacy of slowing fec decline you know that it is not a reversible condition once you have ipf it is not going to revert it can only progress and when you do this intervention probably the rate at which they are worsening can be reduced and that is what is demonstrated in nintenanib shows fpc decline by 50% and so was seen in perfenadon by and large both drugs are good and uh, unluckily we don't have head to head comparison between these two we don't have a data where we have combined both drugs so we are going to learn more in in time to come yes lung transplantation is possibility and there are various centers in india also we have started lung transplant in fact there were a couple of uh, two doctors who underwent lung transplant ipf patient must be picked up early for lung transplantation if situation permits so if you have a patient who's fairly decent lung functions maintained does not have any other comorbidities can be considered for lung transplantation there are some important facts which i thought i would bring it to your notice is majority the patient uh, should not receive mechanical ventilation you know by and large once this patient have got decline in their ipf status that means it is not infection related it is not complication related it is not pneumothorax that patient has got and if this patient requires ventilation most of them will not do well you may not be able to save them a minority of them may majority of patient of ipf should be treated for pulmonary rehabilitation you know pulmonary rehabilitation though is very well studied for copd patient but even in ipf patient they would do well in certain patient it may not be reasonable majority of the patient should be treated with corticosteroids uh, when they have exacerbation but in small proportion of patient it may do more harm pulmonary hypertension by and large in ipf should not be treated because it is due to hypoxia and it is generally a secondary one you don't really need to treat it but in some patient when there is disproportionate pulmonary hypertension it may be reasonable to treat and asymptomatic gid may also require attention in few palliative treatment yes we need to pay attention to that we need to look after a lot of other needs of the patients and like you see in asthma like you see in copd even idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis patients also has got multiple phenotypes you have a rapid worsening patient of pulmonary fibrosis you have patient of pulmonary fibrosis who get frequent exacerbations you have ipf patient who has a very slow decline in their lung functions you may have ipf patient who's got associated air trapping you may have associated copd and you may have ipf patient with pulmonary hypertension yes future is very interesting we may be doing genomic study we may be identififying this patient we may have uh, a certain mm. test helping you one more minute future is very bright there are a lot of studies in in various phases of uh, you know studies you have at least 10 or 12 different molecules to, would be available at the end of next 5 years i would end my presentation by saying that prognosis in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is unpredictable it being a progressive disease early diagnosis appropriate management is vital to maintain quality of life and slow down the disease progress disease management is crucial and includes anti fibrotic therapy 
rehabilitation management of comorbidities supplementation of oxygen social psychological support lung transplantation in selected patients and one must enroll them into clinical trial as and when possible i would thank you by saying that though ipf cannot be prevented so most of the ilds but we have a few options that can help improve the quality of life of our ild patients thank you very much for your patient hearing